Keegan and Company. It's Keegan and Company, the company you keep. That's it. That's got to be it. Welcome back to the Keegan Company podcast. If you guys are new to the show, my name is Keegan Hipgrave and this podcast was created to shine a light on mental health issues by having conversations with athletes and professionals who we all look up to. In this episode, I'm joined by one of the greats in Australian swimming. Uh, she's not only the fastest in the world in her discipline, but also an incredibly kind and genuine person. Ariane Titmuss, how are you? Good, thanks for having me. I'm good. What's um What's happening? You um You did the drive from from Brisbane this morning. Thanks mm-hmm. for coming down. No, it's nice to chuck a little potty on and um t- take the drive down, and it's good. My my goal by the end of the day is to have you converted to Gold Coast living. <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the goal because you moved from you grew up in Tassie. Yeah. Um, moved over mid teens. Why did you choose Brizzy as a as a way where to live? Yeah, well, grew up in Tassie, um, moved up when I was 14, and I guess Brisbane was kind of like where um, the coaches were that I wanna be, wanted to co- swim under. So um, Brisbane was kind of like the hub of swimming, but now it's kind of spread to all of southeast Queensland. There's a great program on the Gold Coast. There's a great program at Sunshine Coast. But, yeah, brizzy has been home for the past eight years. Because I caught up with Mac, and he obviously grew up in Melbourne, and so he did all this swim, but he moved to Gold Coast to swim. Mm. like that. So there's obviously like a pretty good pretty good crew there as well, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, Bowley used to actually – coach where I train now and then Bowley moved down to the coast and so he kind of started that program down there so then yeah. that's why there's this like giant hub on the coast too now. Do you reckon you'll stay in Brizzy? As long as Dean's in Brizzy I'll yeah. be in Brizzy. You and Dean will be together forever? Yeah. yeah yeah like if he was to move wherever he would move like I would go. Yeah cool. Um, yeah love him. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I, I, I think it's probably fitting I wasn't gonna touch on like all of the achievements and like your accomplishments in the intro because it was so long but I wrote I wrote down a a few of them and I know like I feel like I have to touch on it because like that's what you're most known for um Tokyo Olympics 2018 you're 18 years old uh you won the gold at 200 and 400 meter free and Mm -hmm. jump in if I've got any of these wrong okay um and then more recently Commonwealth Games 2022 when you're 22 years old that's when you did the 4p did the 200 meter the 400 meter the 800 meter and the relay. Yeah. Fucking wild. What <laughs> What do you think, are they, which is probably the most memorable experience out of all of those, like, if, like even growing up, what do you think the most memorable experience? Well, I would definitely say at the Olympics, winning gold is probably my most favorite moment because it's, you train your whole life for that and within an instant, you've just achieved your childhood dream and it's like, what do I, you know, what do I do now? Like, it's the most crazy feeling. So that would be one that I'm definitely like the most proud of. But I would actually say probably breaking my first world record was a pretty cool feeling. So it was back in 2018, it was um, world short course and Mm. I broke it in the 400 short course. And, And what actually happened was the hometown girl was in China, the hometown girl, from China had the world record yeah. and the crowd like went crazy when she walked out and um, I was like so G'd up because I was like imagine breaking her world record in her hometown. Yeah. Um, so I did that and I think that was a really cool feeling like breaking a world record for the first time is kind of just so bizarre like it's still so foreign to me like even when you read that stuff I'm like that's just so whack like I never thought that any of this would happen. Because the world like the world's a big place mm-hmm. it's not like it's a small place and you're the fastest in the world for 400. Yeah it's you know what like it's just so crazy like I grew up in a small town of 90,000 people mm. out of Tassie in Tassie I had horses on my front lawn like I was just a bit of a small town girl and loved swimming and then it's just like crazy where life takes you if you work hard. Was it always going to be swimming growing up? Like were you one of those kids where your parents put you into swimming when you're like three years old? What's the, <laughs> what's the story? Well, I know I was doing learn to swim or like swimming with my mom when I was six months old, really young. Yeah. And then um, did swimming all through primary school. And I remember when I was seven, I, I there was like a club down the road and I said, I really want to join and start doing squad training. And around the time was when the Beijing Olympics were on and I saw um, Steph Rice win three gold medals. And I was like, that's going to be me. And um, super keen. As soon as I started, I was like racing eight and unders and just loving it. Like loving the ho- everything surrounding swimming, being in the squad, the training, the racing. And I did like netball, dancing. I had horses. But um, swimming kind of by the time I got to high school was really it for me. Why? Um, because I, I, watched, I watched a little clip um, 
the other day after we caught up and there was a little time when I think your junior coach moved on mm. and you were like swimming by yourself for however many months before going into one of the championships. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah. So my coach at the time in Tassie was moving back to Brisbane because he just said the culture down there like wasn't conducive to high performance. And then that's kind of what forced me out of the state because um, I was left with no coach down there and I didn't want to do the sessions that the people in the squad were doing because they were like <laughs> too easy and I just like <laughs> and, and, and like I had just qualified for my first Australian team I was 14 and you know we we're getting everything ready to move to Brisbane but you know moving into state as a whole family is a, a big deal so um Pete came back and I, I was like well I've got to keep training so he would like text me my sessions every day yeah. and I would go into the pool pay like the f- public fee entry and jump in with the oldies and just swim around them have no one time me do my 7k as a 14 year old morning a night um, around school and did that for three months and looking back I was like fuck that's crazy that's like wild. I can't believe I did that um but I guess it goes to show what you do when you super disciplined and have a goal and yeah do you reckon that stuff like builds resilience like doing things by yourself I had a school coach and he said the best thing that you can do is train by yourself when like no one else is watching because you build up this like inner confidence and you have like a stack of evidence for like your own self-belief yeah Well, you know what? I think training on your own makes you realize what type of person you are because when you're in a squad and you've got your coach there, like you can't take shortcuts because people are going to know about it. Whereas if you're on your own, you can take a shortcut or skip this or skip that and not do it properly and no one has to know. So I think you figure out like what type of person you are when you're on your own. But you're also like swimming by yourself. Like you're not like mucking, I'm sure you're mucking around with like the other crew when you're stopped, but when you're swimming, you're staring at a dotted line for like hours on end. What do you think about? Well, it depends. Like in a um, recovery session, like when it's slow, long swimming, probably (laughs) songs going or what I'm doing for the day or what I'm going to make for dinner or I'm still trying to like focus on my technique. Mm. Um, But then in like a main session, like where it's tough and you're trying to grind out and hit your times, like I'm thinking about every stroke and like counting my strokes every lap. What do you think, this might be a weird question coming from me to you, but like, what do you think sets you apart? Like what's, what's different? Cause you're obviously, you're performing at such a high level. Like you're at the highest level. What, what do you reckon makes it different? Makes you different? I don't know. I mean, maybe coming from a humble beginning, um, and knowing how hard I had to work to get to where I am. But I feel like I have this thing inside of me. Dean said that he's never met an athlete that can like in training go to a place um, like take it to that next level. He hasn't seen many athletes that are willing to go to that kind of house of pain. Um, And I actually enjoy that. Like I I prefer training than racing. Really? Yeah. I like swim to train. That's what – because that's what Max says. Like Matt Matt Horton, he was just like I love – being uncomfortable like I love how hard it gets you obviously the same yeah and it's more so like yeah it's shit when you're in it and it hurts bad but as soon as you finish and you've achieved something like that the feeling of relief after a great session being like tick that's banked like um it builds confidence to race and I think that's probably I don't know I just feel like I thrive on building up that confidence in training to race and you take you obviously take that confidence into competing like on game day or race day yeah um do you ever get nervous? Because you've done, you would have done so many races, like big races now. Do you still get nervous going into those big races? Yeah, and it's great. Like, um, so I'll never, I like, I don't know. I remember when I was younger, I used to get quite nervous, but I always thought it was a good thing. And the first time I really felt the nerves was um, Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast 2018. And it was kind of like the first time I felt that the nation was expecting me to win. And I was only 17 at the time. And I remember I warmed up for the 400 and um, I was so off and I went to the toilets and like went over the toilet to like almost vomit. I was so nervous. And I came out and I like did a PB and won and it was all fine. But that taught me that like nerves are actually a good thing. Like I was, my body was just getting ready to go. So then this year when I went to Worlds to race and had probably the best swim of my career, I was getting so nervous in the day and I was like, yes, like my body is ready. Like I'm ready to go. Have you had many conversations with role models or people you look, look up to about nerves or what to do on race day? I've spoken to Thorpey a little bit. Like I think he's someone that had to deal with the pressure like no one else. Um, 
it's a very tough feeling knowing that every time you go into race, you're expected to win and he probably had to deal with that more than anyone. So it's just really having that inner belief. I think that you're dealing with so much other noise around you. If you don't even have confidence in yourself, it's going to be near impossible to try and perform. So he was the one that told me like, block it all out. Just think about yourself. And I never forget this one thing. And he said, um, they have to beat you. You don't have to beat them. They have to beat you. And that just kind of sticks with me. And I, I stand behind the block feeling like ready to go. That's so cool. Yeah. That's so cool to say. Um, but you, I imagine you'd probably be someone who thrives under that pressure though, right? Yeah. I <laughs> Look, it, it, it comes with good and bad things. Like I do enjoy it. Like pressure is a privilege. It doesn't, doesn't come along unless um, you've done, done something to receive that pressure. Um, I think it's about how you use it. Like, you know, you can look at it as a bad thing and think, why do they like put all this pressure on me? Like, you know, these people don't even know anything. But I think that if you use it to create the nervous energy, it just can all kind of combine to become this amazing ball of energy to race. Yeah. And I try not to listen or read too much um, before I race. But um, this year, actually, though, I feel like there was a lot of noise around um, my races. And I, I actually jumped on and read one article and I never really do that. And people were commenting like, um, Titmus is going to win bronze. And that just... Is it burn? Yeah, fired me up so much. Yeah. And um, I think that helped. But I think going into next year for the Olympics, um, going in as defending champion and world record holder, I think it's going to be a whole new level of pressure that I'm going to have to deal with. Yeah. Like I know within myself that whatever I do, I should be proud of. But I know that from the outside, I'm expected to win. And genuinely, if I don't win, I feel like I've let the nation down, which is a stupid thing to say. But like um, – that's kind of what it feels like. And I feel like swimming is, we've done so well over the years. We've kind of done it to ourselves. Um, you know, going into these races, you're just expected to win. But that, that obviously comes just from media. Like, do you read into that stuff when you're just swimming? Like, do you do you read the articles? Because I'm like, <clears throat> with, with footy, I would know, like, the best advice people would give me and mates, like, I feel under the radar a lot, but, like, guys who were at a very high level, they would just be like, just don't read it. Yeah. Like, don't read the comments. Like, don't read. It's not going to help. It doesn't help you. It's, it's someone else's opinion. It's not It's not you. Like, I imagine you should lean on your friends and your family because they would typically have the same values of you, right? Yeah. I, d I never read it. Yeah. And, like, I don't go on social media when I'm racing at, like, a high level meet. Um, I get someone else to go on and do it for me because it's just too overwhelming. Whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, it, it's too much to try and deal with all the noise. But the thing is, I feel like the pressure that I put on myself and the coach that my coach puts on me is probably even more than yeah. all the external noise. So that's just enough, I think. Yeah. Do you have, <clears throat> do you have a feeling, I think we were, we were talking about this the other day, like, cause obviously swimming and footy and AFL, like they're all like, they're very different sports. Like, yeah. And you guys are on a pedestal. Like you guys are almost like with footy players, they have to, you know, if they do something, they muck up or if they in the papers for, you know, drinking or whatever it is, like, oh, well, they're just footy players. They do it all yep. the time. But you guys have, I think, such a more intense pressure because you're like forced to be perfect all the time. It's like you put in a box and if you not even step out of line, but if you like deviate from the little box that they put you in, it's like, well, they're not, they're doing something wrong. Yeah. Um, I feel like from the outside, I, you know, no one knows beyond the surface level, I think like you look at the swimmers and we go there to win medals and represent our country. And I feel like we, <laughs> I mean, I feel like we are well behaved. Like, yeah, yeah, well, well, that's what I mean. You are, you guys are. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I feel like the pressure on us, like, like you just said, if we did one bad thing as, as a footy player, I feel like it flies under the radar because it's just like the stigma around footy. But if like, I don't even know what a bad thing would be that a swimmer would do, but yeah. um, I feel like it would be massive noise because we've always kind of had this cookie cutter, perfect Olympic sport. Um, I mean, there ha has definitely been like some bad um, moments, um, but I feel like the culture at the moment is probably, since I've been on the team, which was end of 2016, probably the best that it's ever been. Really? Why is that? I feel like um, we've started to have these real conversations. I mean, something we've tried to talk about as a group is that when you're winning, it doesn't always mean that um, your culture is great. And yeah. it's about 
just because you're winning um, doesn't mean there's other things that can still be work, um, you can still work on. So we've been trying to work on that as a team and kind of have connections as athletes um, beyond just performing, actually have connections as people. And I feel like um, 2019 Worlds, the Tokyo Olympics, and then this team this year, I feel like was the best kind of vibe. Um, I feel like we didn't, we'd go back to the pool and come back to the dining hall and just talk about like – no, nothing regarding swimming at all yeah. and I remember when I first made the team I was 16 and um I'd like be so scared to go to dinner because I'd be like who am I gonna sit really? with and, like, <laughs> really yeah and like oh no one knows me like I'm this little tazzy girl but now I feel like rookies coming coming onto the team are so lucky whereas like they can just come down and hang out with anyone and everyone's just seems equal and mm. no one's put on a pedestal and um I feel like really proud that we've kind of got that at the moment that's so nice I always wondered about the culture in the Aussie team because you guys train and in, in everywhere in the world in, in Australia, right? How how is it? Do you guys do much like team bonding stuff together? Because you're only together for a short amount of yeah. time, right? Yeah. Well, I'm really lucky. I'm in a really big squad that. Um, so we had ten from my squad on the national team this year. Great. So like a third of the team is in wow. I train with. So I feel like I kind of get that already. But then. Around like trials, we come together for a day after and do like a session. Um, and then, you know, whenever we're racing at nationals or states or whatever, we always see each other. But it is bizarre how we're like in different hubs around the country and do kind of come together for a couple of weeks before going overseas. But you race with these people all the time since you're like 14 years old. So, um, and coming through with them. So you kind of know them from when you're younger. What was it like when you first got your pair of Aussie togs at 16? Cool. I was actually going through my um, phone the other day. I was trying to delete all these photos and I found a photo and it's, um, I remember I got like in the mail all my kit and I laid it out on the whole like lounge room floor and like laying there in the star like <laughs> yeah. with all my stuff. And you know what is sad that now when I get my kit, I don't feel like that. I'm like, oh, like it's so much stuff. Like mm. where am I? Storage, whatever. And I think you probably take it for granted the more you get it. Whereas I'm trying to like be really now present and um know that every time you get to wear the australian colors is such a privilege and you work so hard for it um because you want to try and have that feeling of when you're a rookie all the time like yeah. when you're a rookie on the team like it's just the best like it's you, so wild yeah hey, I imagine. yeah yep. um what's what's the plans for the next couple of months i i, I actually I'd, I'd really like to talk about Probably how we connected. Um, more recently, you put up a really, I guess, like beautiful and inspiring Instagram post about the surgery that you had done. And for me, when I saw that, I was like, wow, this is a really, obviously great thing for other people who might be going through something similar. And that's why I reached out and I think that's why we connected. And you, for me, you don't seem like an arrogant person at all you seem someone who's very <laughs> humble who's very genuine and also curious as well like when we caught up the other day I s stepped away from that conversation you know when you get like a really good gut feel about someone yeah. and you just like you just like oh, I walked away I was like I love where like where your head's at um but what I was getting at is like yeah that Instagram post about the surgery that had you had and I thought wow this would be really great for other people who might be going through something similar um could you touch on on what what's been happening over the last couple of months and 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 what you had removed if yeah. you're comfortable yeah yeah um so i have had an ongoing hip injury for years now and it kind of flares up and goes away and it was kind of annoying me so booked in to get mri on the left hip and then they were very thorough and scanned my whole pelvis um, region i guess and um found a growth on my right ovary so completely unrelated to the hip um and I think it was, I think as an athlete, you are all the time so worried about <laughs> keeping your body in check to perform yeah. and only worrying about getting your sleep, eating right, physio, massage, all this just to perform every day. And you kind of forget about the other areas of your body and like the purpose that they serve. Yeah. And so when you, you hear that you've got like a tumour on your ovary, it cuts pretty deep and I yeah. think someone like me ever since I was younger I always have wanted to have kids and yeah. it's something that you just expect is going to happen when you're older and yeah. so then when you get told something that could potentially interfere with that it's really scary. So they they scanned your whole pelvic region and then was it a conversation with like your doctor your club doctor? Yeah so um, what happened was my physio told me 
what was going on with my hip, which is all fine and manageable. And then she said, you should ring the doctor back. He's got something else to tell you. And I was like, come on, just tell just, me. Just tell me. Yeah. Were you nervous or was it just yeah, like it could be anything? Well, I kind of joked about the fact that it was something bad. And I was like, oh, I've probably got like, I don't know, cancer or whatever. And that's a bit of a joke. And then he rings me and goes, yeah, Arnie, like um, you've got this growth on your ovary. Look, we think that it's um, – like we think this is what it is, but we still don't know. So you're going to have to go. And luckily I have a wonderful women's health specialist who could do the surgery. So she's like, he said, you need to go and see her and go through everything. So I was so nervous for that doctor's appointment and I got there. And at this point we didn't know how big it was or we had a, a clue at what it could have been, but I still had to go through and do all of like the tumor markers, had to go and get like ultrasounds to figure out how big it was and figure out exactly what it was. And, and that was really scary. I remember going and doing like the, the blood test for cancer and I was yeah. like I never thought that I'd be doing this and um at 23 years old yeah right? and then and then going to get the ultrasound to f- see how big it was and I remember the lady was like far out like this is big so my so the the growth was inside my ovary and my ovary was um eight and a half by seven centimeters and my other ovary was like one by one and a half so it's huge it was huge and she was like far out you've got to get this out and I think that at that point when when it's that big you start to really wonder like what implications it had on my ovary and all that type of thing and a lot like over the years yeah and whether removing it whether removing it was going to be difficult and they'd have to take the ovary you know there's still a risk that a low risk but still a risk that when they'd go to remove the growth that my ovary wouldn't stop bleeding that have to remove the whole ovary. So they, they told you that before yeah. going into the ob? Yeah. Like there's a chance that we might have to remove it? Yeah. And like, you know what's the toughest part is that the one part of me was like trying to forget about swimming and be like, my health is the most important thing. And, and after this surgery, I want to recover the best I can to come back and just be really healthy and get back into swimming um, when I'm ready. And then the other part of me is like this voice in my head being like, come on, like, hurry up. Like, you've got to get back for swimming, swimming. And so then I'm, like, battling this. And so I think that it's now that I'm kind – because I kind of buried all the emotion about mm. what I actually went through. It's kind of now that I'm dealing with that. But like I was saying to you the other day, I feel kind of stupid for feeling, like, scared or upset because I'm actually fine. Like, I'm one of the lucky ones and I'm very lucky that it was removed easily and it was nothing serious and I had no implications on my health, but, um, it was really scary, like really scary. But those feelings are real. Like you say, like you feel stupid. You shouldn't feel stupid at all because that's a, that's a real feeling. There was a, there was a probability that you're, you know, you might not have children one day. And obviously like that's so important to you, right? Yeah. And you know what? It's probably... I wasn't going to tell anyone about it and only a few people knew about it when I was going through it because I didn't want to deal with the noise. But I think for me, I feel grateful that I have this platform that could potentially start the conversation and make people realise that if they were going through something similar, that it's normal and it's okay. Like I am a professional athlete and my body is like my vehicle. You're and very in tune with your body. Yeah. And even my body like stuffs up. Like, yeah. So I think that like that's what I wanted to kind of start by getting it out there. And um, since I've had so many women like message me and be like, I had a massive one and I lost my ovary, but I like got pregnant with one ovary. And it was pretty cool to like hear from women and all their different stories. And um, yeah, I think I'm still dealing with it all. Like, you know, it's frustrating as well being like behind where I wanted to be at this point in the season because the recovery from a surgery like this is not um, simple. Like, Mm. um, but like I had no choice, like for me and my, um, where I want to go in my life, I just had to get it out. How, um, how does it affect your training now? So, so when did you get it done? You got it done four, five, weeks, five ago. weeks ago. And so I didn't, I wasn't doing anything for like two weeks and then, um, slowly got back in. I wore like a floaty around my waist <laughs> and I was like floating, doing like, um, dog paddle for like 200 meters and slowly build up. And then. Um, so I'm, yeah, five and a half weeks post now and I'm about 75% volume and low intensity still, but probably next week I could probably get back to full volume, but Mm. nothing's ever going to be linear. Like you think uh, the past couple of weeks I've made such great shifts, but then I think, yeah, I'm so on, but I've been back in the gym for like a week and, um, gym, like you got to be careful. And Mm. I just pulled up so sore, like, um, yeah, down there and it's just hard. Like you feel like you're 
take another step back. And it's just so frustrating. Like my squad is so fit at the moment yeah. and I just feel like a blob. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But you train with the – you like you, – you race against the boys. You were telling me like you, you always try and keep up with the boys. Yeah, well, we've got a pretty good distance crew um, at my club. So there's – um, a couple of girls that's from the 400 as well with me and then there's a few guys um, a couple of the younger boys are around my speed are a little bit faster which I try and like match up with mm. um, I like going with the girls sometimes too to um, like try and be in f- as front as, in front as I can but then sometimes Dean puts me with the boys and I try and like clip onto their heels and um, be with the boys so that's good that I really like training um, with guys and girls like I think it's a good dynamic in the, can you tell me a little bit more about like the lead up to an Olympics? Because obviously you've got four years, like it's every four years, you've got Worlds and you've got other short courses in the middle of that. You said it's not linear. How, what is a training, what are you trying to get out of a training week? Are you trying to be at your best every week? I imagine that's probably not possible. What does it look like? in order to get there? Like, what would a dream look like? <laughs> well. Or is it just rogue? <laughs> um, no, like it's very specific. So, so there's like, for me in a normal week, there's nine or 10 sessions. If I do 10, it's um, just easy swimming on a Friday afternoon, mm. but every session has a purpose. Yep. And like, you want to tick that box for that session. So there's four, there's four really hard sessions a week. And especially when you're getting closer to a major competition, like for me personally, like I go into those big training sessions nervous because if I'm not performing and hitting my times, then your confidence just takes a shot and you feel like you're not on track to where you need to be. Like I know where I should be at certain points of the season to try and reach my goals. Um, But it's a lot. Like I think about um, the magnitude of Olympic Games and, you know, you train your whole life to one, get on the team at trials, Mm. which is six weeks before and like everything has to be perfect to make that team. Like you can't be sick on the day. Like everything's got to go. If you're sick on the day, then it's like – stiff shit you've still just got to try and get on the team and if you don't like you know you don't um but then it's bizarre how you do like for you guys like I envy you guys so hard like (laughs) uh, like you if you have a shit game it's like well you can kind of like fly under the radar with your teammates it's like whatever I'll come back next week and play and if you don't win a premiership it's like well I can go again next year and next year and next year whereas like I have three minutes like 55 once every four years to try and like do it as perfect as I can and, and, and win. And if I don't, then I don't. Like, like, that's so wild to think about. Like you got four years and just to be on in one moment. Yeah. So the thing is I had an injury, a shoulder injury before Tokyo. So I tore my subscap um, six months out from the Olympic Games and so I've never had... Does, does everyone know about that? Do well, people know about that? Really? Kind of, yeah. kind of. I tried to keep it under the radar. You don't radar. want to tell anyone? Well, people kind of know about it now. Yeah. But pretty much it's one thing trying to rehab the shoulder and get back, which I knew would be fine. But it's like you're on a timeline. It's mm. like if I don't get back in not enough time, then my whole Olympics is over. And that was my first Olympics. And it's like I've trained my whole life since I was like... 12, 13, like Olympics was like it for me. And I've trained my whole life and I get a bloody shoulder injury six months out from the one week of my life where I'm supposed to perform the best I can to try and like achieve my childhood dream. And so then you start getting this anxiety around like um, being, if, it, if you're going to be back in time. So I wasn't doing proper sessions until mid-March, um, which was three months out from the Olympics. And I just went nuts because I was trying to like play catch up. Yeah. Um, Shoulder was still like in pain every day, but like it was manageable. You just have to get through it to like be able to perform in July. And it's pretty whack to think about, to be honest. Yeah. Like I think about now we're on the countdown. It's like, what, eight, nine months to the Olympics next year. And, you know, that sounds like a lot of time, but it'll go fast. But when you try and play catch up, are you scared of like overtraining? Because I'm sure you guys would have to be very conscious. I'm sure you got people who looks after that, but would you be conscious of like overtraining, trying to get back or not? Nah? No. Nah. Really? <laughs> no. Nah. I was, because my first session I came back, like based on the times I should have been doing over like 200 meter efforts, I was like 10 seconds off the pace. And I was like, shit, I'm so far off. Like I'm not going to even make the team. Like that's how slow I was because I had lost so much conditioning. Um, and so I just went nuts because really? you're on like this timeline. Like that's the thing. Whereas, um, 
you know, you guys play every week and it's like, I might come back in round, whatever. I might come back, but I've got to be back for like this moment. So that stuff's scary. So you have to, you kind of, at the moment, you have to kind of like wrap yourself in cotton wool because yeah. you don't want anything to go wrong now. Do you ever get in your own head? Like thinking, like, I'm sure you, like, do you ever have those thoughts where you're like, oh, maybe I can't do it? Because from the outside looking in, I'm looking like, oh, this girl's done it before. You know, she's like obviously the fastest in the world. She's just going to go out and smash it. Like, do you ever have those thoughts of, nah, I might not make it? Or like, do you ever have those thoughts? Um, yeah, but I feel like you can kind of counteract those by doing the work. Mm. So if you've done enough work, I feel like it's hard to try. It's hard to think like that if you've got the confidence in your training. But one thing that is frustrating is like you said before, from the outside, like Australian public can be like, yeah, like Arnie, she's got it. She's gonna win like and no one has any understanding of like what goes on mm. behind the scenes and the amount of times that you fail in training to try and get to that point like no one understands how many fails you have to win at the you know high end you were saying the other day that um the the times are almost too quick so they're always made for you to fail yeah so like the standard of training is pretty high and yeah. it's very rare that i'll like get everything and like, hit every time in training and if I do I'll get like a good job girl like, <laughs> really? yeah um just nothing yeah nothing but or like I'll get like a text like good job um but I know when I'm on when like I'm consistently maybe leading up to a meet um consistently for like two or three weeks like being able to do it every mm. session and that's when I'm like get this aura and like feel that I'm kind of getting ready to go do you have much to do with any like mindset coaches or psychs? Not really. Like I've never spoken to a sports psych in my life. Really? So I would say that Dean is probably like, I don't know. I'd say he probably works as a psych for me. Like um, I've spoken to a psych about things in my personal life. Yeah. But that I felt like were overflowing into my swimming and affecting my swimming. But mm. I've never spoken to a um, sports psych about like sleeping or preparing to race or managing training or um, managing nerves or things like yeah. that. I feel like probably one of my gifts is my mind. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Why? In like what way? I feel like I kind of eat pressure for breakfast. You like it? Yeah. yeah. I feel like I just try and like use that the best I can and, and, and block it out. And, and I enjoy the feeling of kind of being at the highest um, level in my sport and kind of having that expectation as tough as it is. Um, I feel like I can thrive under it. Do you reckon you would take that into life after swimming? Or do you think, because I know there's certain things that I am very comfortable with. Like in football, I, I was very comfortable having really tough conversations with coaches and CEOs and because you've done it so many times. Yeah. And I imagine it's similar for you. You've done so much work in swimming that that pressure, of course, you would eat it up. But there are other times where I'm like, I'm actually, I'm not prepared for that. And that pressure sort of got to me a little bit. Do you get, I don't know. I, I said the same thing to Mac. I was like, you will be successful after football because you're so determined, like you're just so driven and you're hardworking and you're obviously kind and you're very good with people. So I think you're going to be very successful in whatever you do. But do you think that there's like a correlation between having done all the work in swimming and taking that life after? Do you think about that often? Uh, sometimes. I, I think that it will potentially like, yeah, overflow into it. But um, I think with swimming because like it's my – um, my trade, like it's mm. what, it's my, my thing. It's what I'm, it's what I'm good at. And I feel like, um, it's easy to have confidence in yourself and, um, deal with the pressure in that. Cause I'm so well trained in it. Whereas I think going into other areas of my life beyond swimming, maybe I won't have the same confidence level or, um, expertise in that. So maybe it will be different. Um, but I don't know. I feel like you learn a lot about yourself as a person going through this as an athlete too. And swimming for hours on end by, by yourself. I'm sure you're very accustomed to being by yourself in your own head. Yeah. Oh my God, actually like trying to come back from this surgery, I've got to like build my aerobic base up heaps. And so it's a lot of long swimming. I think I'm going to buy those um, like headphones you can put on under your cap. Oh really? Yeah. Cause I'm just like, I'm going to get so bored. Just long, straight, like 5k straight, easy. Put a little podcast on, a little bit of music. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, that, like that is boring. Yeah. Like that's really boring. What, um, what do you want to do life after swimming? Do you have you thought about that? Is there anything that's interesting, interested for you? Well, like I try not to think about it too much, to be honest. Like I do, but I don't want to let it consume my mind when like my goals at the moment um, 
are so at the forefront of my mind. Like the Olympics yeah. is just like because it's like one shot. But one thing that I've really enjoyed dabbling in a little bit is like the media side of things. Yeah. I was telling you the other day. Yeah. Um, so I want to get into that a little bit, but I don't want that to be like my sole purpose. I think yeah. I feel like I'll have other things that I'll, I'll figure out. Like I feel like um, I got a lot to give more um, as a person outside of swimming when I'm done swimming but it's just trying to like figure out what that will be you're very curious like you strike me as a very curious person I feel like whatever you dive into you're just gonna be like a hundred percent in <laughs> yeah yeah because you don't want to half-ass anything hey like you just you know I say this like you you don't regret the things you um did do in life you regret the things you didn't do yeah. and so um yeah, I kind of just, I wouldn't want to go into anything and just like be like half acid and whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you reckon you get that from your parents? Are your parents pretty determined people as well? Yeah, I'd say my mum is more competitive than me and really? more driven. Yeah. Like she's working harder now in her mid 50s than she was like, than what I remember when I was little. Like she's yeah. just so goal driven and I definitely get that from her. And, and dad's the same. And they were both athletes when they were younger. So I feel like I kind of, they get it and I kind of get that from them too. Were they swimming? The running? No, my mum was a sprinter. Okay. She was actually pretty quick. Yeah. Um, and my, my dad played um, cricket and volleyball for Tassie. So I feel like I've kind of grew up in a great environment with my parents and they understand sport. And um, I think that's very underrated, like having a family around you that know how to parent an athlete. And actually um, after doing it, my it's something my mum's really passionate about. And I was telling you that yeah. she goes around and like tries to do workshops to teach parents like how to – parent an athlete and not like be the coach from home and not put the pressure on and just kind of do the jobs around the house to help your child like be the best athlete and person they can be. I'm sure that's like so many like that's a thing that so many parents need to hear like because you hear about so many crazy I'm sure swimming yeah. parents but like surfing parents, footy parents, like any sport right like they're just so obsessed might be like trying to live through their kids. I was caught up with um, one of the guys from Red Bull. They did a Red Bull surfing camp in Cooley, I think like earlier this year. And so it was like all the top surfers in the world or maybe Australia between like 13 and 15. And they got a um, they got a house in Coolangatta and it was pretty much just a week. The parent would stay there with the kid and they would just have a week of like surfing and, and conversations and they would bring people in. And they brought Mick Fanning and his mum in to have a conversation on one of the first nights and um, my mate was telling me, and he's a, obviously really good mates with Mick and, and his mum. And it was just a Q&A set up. Like they just got up, they got maybe like 10 or 15 of the kids and their parents. And the mum, like Mick's mum was so good because he was talking exactly what you just said. Yeah. Like he's like, I, she's like, I'm not a surf coach. Like Mick will look after the surfing. I'm going to look after everything outside of that, whether it's like nutrition, whether it's getting like boards ready, whether it's getting everything ready. And he said all the parents, like it was just like a, you could hear a penny drop. Like you, they were just so in awe of what they were talking, what he was talking about yeah. and what she was talking about. And then the parents afterwards were like, oh, funny that. It seems like that conversation was directed to us. <laughs> well, yeah. That mum does the same thing. A lot of parents don't know like what goes into like parenting athlete. Even so, like we talk about like not being a coach from home and um, just being like the chef, the laundromat the driver like yeah. all that to help you out but I had my first drug test when I was 12 years old yeah and like a lot of parents were like no you're not watching my kid pee whereas like you like mum was like no you have to be prepared that your kid might be good and you've got to be prepared for that so yeah it's pretty cool and I'm pretty proud of mum for doing that I feel like a lot of athletes kind of get pushed out of their sport early because they feel that pressure from home or they've got yeah. that crazy helicopter mum or whatever yeah. um so I feel like it's an area that people can talk about more and um I think it's cool that mum's doing it. Do you lean on your mum and dad for, for like sporting advice at all or like how to deal with pressure or anything like that? Do you have those conversations at home? I don't talk about swimming at all to mum and dad. Really? Yeah, like, but I have a great relationship with my family. Like I'm really close and I think it's because when I come, well, I don't live at home anymore, but like when I'm around my family, I feel like I can just vent and be myself and relax and I feel no pressure whatsoever to perform. Like if I was to say tomorrow I want to stop, there would be no question. Like yeah. they'd be like, okay. Um, I just feel very lucky in that sense. And I, I probably talk to mum and dad more about like things outside of swimming and yeah. get advice on that and what's going on in my life um, with friends or squad mates or anything. Um, I think it's good to try and have conversations outside of swimming. Well, you're like swimming is your whole life, right? Like I imagine you obviously wouldn't want to take that home. Like a lot of my best mates when I was playing footy, 
didn't even know football or didn't yeah. even didn't even like football. Like, don't get me wrong, I liked football. I didn't love footy. Like, even guys that we were playing with, they just played because they were good at it. You know, mm-hmm. and you know what I mean? And so when we were, we were hanging, and it's also nice, keeps you humble. Like, yeah. And uh, even like, I remember crew were like, oh, did you watch the game the other night? Like, did you watch that? I was like, nah, I didn't watch the game. Like, well, why not? Mm. It's like, well, you know, footy's like, footy's our life. Like, it's, we do it all the time. I'm not going to, like, if you're a plumber, are you going to go watch plumbing videos <laughs> when you get home? Like, like, <laughs> like I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, like, obviously you do your video, um, you do all that, but I don't want to take that stuff home. Well, I probably reckon when I was younger, I was more of like a, obsessed like I'd watch everything and I just loved swimming so much but I feel like as you get older um you kind of want to separate your life a little bit away from it because you you know you've been in swimming so long what are what are some things that you do to like kind of level yourself out like do you have any de-stresses or any things that you like to do away from swimming um I love cooking do you do you really yeah oh I didn't know that yeah so I feel like that's where I like potter around and like make up recipes like a bit of a de-stress um, I don't know. It's relaxing. Like, I, you know what? At the moment, like, I don't plan what I'm making for dinner at home. I'll, like, go to the supermarket and just oh, get, yeah. like, meat for five nights and just have, like, everything in the fridge. And then I'll yeah. get home and just use what I have and, like, make it up. That is, like, my favourite thing about you, I think. Like, because yeah. I'm the same. Like, my parents, they, they've had um, <clears throat> veggie gardens forever. Like, my, uh, my cousin who was a chef, my auntie in Melbourne, she's got, like, a probably – garden the size of this room just full of like edible food and we'll just like we'll go out to the garden we'll like make our salad we'll go get and we'll just cook from scratch yeah but how therapeutic is it like walking through like a farmer's market or like a yep. supermarket and I just know. like making your own making your own stuff I like it sounds so weird but <laughs> I love going to the supermarket like love like shopping for my week like planning it all out um yeah cooking's good love cooking yeah. um you know you find other things to do but cooking's the main thing yeah. um I enjoy the work that I do with some of my sponsors outside of swimming. Like it, I feel like it detracts me away from swimming and I get to meet cool people. Um, even like a couple of weeks ago, I had to film some content for Harvey Norman and I got to meet, um, the head chef of this restaurant in Brisbane called Joy and her wait list to dine there is like years. Yeah. I was like, she's at my house cooking. She came to your house. Yeah. And, um, that stuff's cool. Or I've done a lot of stuff for the VRC and the Melbourne cup and I've gotten to meet some amazing people and I actually, Became quite close with Glenn Boss, who rode Maccabi Diva to three Melbourne Cups and yeah. had great conversations with him. And I think he, even meeting like stylists and makeup artists and all these people from different walks of life, mm. learning about them is really cool. That's what I mean. Like you're so curious. That's why I think you'll kill it after, after swimming. Do you reckon you'd ever like get into like owning restaurants or having your own restaurant? Maybe. I think maybe that's the space that I haven't, like I've thought about it, but still not quite sure. But I'd want to like involve food in my life somehow after yeah. swimming as well. Um, I don't know whether it'd be like restaurant managing or whatever, but maybe. Maybe like I want to write like a cute little cookbook or something yeah, like on his cookbook. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd use that cookbook. That's something that I would get. <laughs> That's like a little clip that you can grab for later. I mean, when I was playing footy, I didn't know what I wanted to do after footy. Um, but it's it's different to you. Like we weren't going for you know an Olympic gold. Like every four years, we had a career. Um, like a, we would play every week. And I remember thinking, I was like, well, I want to figure out what I don't want to do just so I can figure out what I wanted to do. Yeah. So I tried everything. Like I worked at, um, I didn't work, but I did a couple of days at Labart in Burley. It's like a little fine dining restaurant. And every Thursday they would do a food prep day. I remember I called Alex and I was like, hey mate, like, do you, like obviously leaning on mates. I was like, do you mind if I just come in and help prep for the day? <laughs> he's like, yeah, hundred percent. And it was so cool. Like obviously I'm just peeling prawns and like doing nothing special. Yeah, maybe someone gets some like carrots to chop too big. And yeah. Then <laughs> yeah. What's going on here? But it was so cool. Um, obviously like doing, like figuring out what you don't want to do, I think is just as important as figuring out what yeah. you want to do. And you're in such a cool position now where you can like go and have conversations with chefs and, and, and lean on people who are in different industries. And even when you come out you can lean on them to talk about what you might want to do afterwards yeah and actually um it's been pretty cool to work with Harvey Norman for a few years because Katie Page who's a CEO she's like such a powerhouse um you know in the business world and as a woman it's pretty cool that she kind of like dominates that and it's cool having conversations with her about that too Mm, unreal um Arnie thank you Thanks so much for the conversation today. What's what do you think's the biggest thing that we haven't spoken about today that you'd like to touch on? I don't know. I just think it's really important to me. I feel like everyone knows me as Ariane Titmus, the swimmer, which mm. is great. Like that's a massive part of my life. But I feel like um, I try to be as authentic as I can in front of the camera or um, 
you know, when I'm in the spotlight and I really want people to see like me for who I am. And I feel like I have so much more as a person to offer than just swimming fast for our country. Um, so I feel like, yes, I have my goals in the pool that I want to achieve, but um, I feel like now my role as an athlete is to try and like get people um, to get to know me better and try and be that role model for young swimmers and um, inspire people that come from small towns that if you work hard, like you have just as much chance as someone that comes from a big city and that's something that I'm really passionate about. Did you, I, I was going to wrap it up, but did you struggle coming over to Australia from Tassie? Australia, you reckon? Coming over from, oh, that was, that's, <laughs> oh no, that's going to be. The mainland, the mainland. The, the mainland. Did you struggle coming over to, um, from Tassie to Brizzy? Yeah, I did because Tassie is like such a small place that like if I, as an 11 year old, I was in the back page of the paper for winning state championship medals. Really? So it's like so, um, such a small place. The tall poppy syndrome is huge down there because, um, you know, the population's smaller. I thought everyone was just relaxed in Tassie. Yeah, but like, I don't know. You know, I was a 13 year old girl trying to keep up with like the 18 year old boys in training. And, like, people don't like that. People yeah. don't like the fact that um, you're trying to beat the boys as a young girl. And so, you you know, you kind of cop it. Um, but then it was – coming into the swimming program in Brisbane, I loved because I was in this group of people that were all good, tr striving to be the best, all working hard together, creating this great working environment. Coming into school, like, I um, – struggled a little bit like it was very different like I never really had to make a friend in my life in Launceston like yeah. I went through primary school with all my friends went into high school with all of them whereas like coming to Brisbane you know, this big city I didn't yeah. know anyone yeah. so it was different like coming into school and I was like who's this swimmer yeah. um but you know I'm settled now so yeah. did you um did you because training would have been such a huge part of your life like when you were growing up was it just like normal schooling for you well I did year 11 and 12 over three years so yeah. I did an extra year of school so I do like three subjects a year instead of like six or seven yeah. um but my last year was 2018 like the extra year was 2018 and I was away for like 16 weeks because I had com games pan packs and world short course all in the one year yeah. and I always tried so hard at school my whole life and I was like prided myself on being a good student as well but then like towards the end I just couldn't keep up with both and yeah. so like my grades did go down but like at the end of the day you know I think school was good to learn good time management but school's not the be all and the end all like yeah. you can do so many things even if you don't do well at school yeah. um but yeah extra year of school look looking back it sucked that I did an extra year but I couldn't yeah. have done it if I hadn't done that did you do like world short course and then go back to school afterwards no because world sh actually Actually, yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember it's the most bizarre thing ever because, or yeah. like even Com Games, yeah. like I just take like three weeks off school because I'm racing at Com Games on the Gold Coast. And you're like this like big Commonwealth Games gold medalist. Yeah. You know, at the time, Prince Charles presented me with my medals. Really? And then go back to school and it's like, oh, you're in trouble because like you haven't <laughs> handed your assignment in. Oh, never forget. I had an economics assignment due term two. I handed it in on the last day of year 12. Yeah. Like I just, they kind of let me go a little bit. But. Well, they ha I'm sure they would have to show there's a bit of leniency yeah. there. Yeah. But yeah, school seems like a long time ago. Yeah. Um, Arnie, hey, thank you so much for jumping on. Thank you for being vulnerable and telling your story and, and getting us to know a little bit more about you. Um, I'm so excited to see what the next couple of years look like for you. Good luck for Paris. Um, I'm backing you and I think the rest of Australia is backing you as well. So thank you. Oh, thanks.